So hello everyone, thank you for uh, the organizers for having me here and thank you for the audience. Um, I would really like for the presentation to be projected, please. Um, I'll give myself a few seconds to see the presentation. Oui, oui, c'est bon. Okay, I cannot see the presentation, so that it will be difficult for me to follow if I can't see it. Euh, je vais euh, essayer euh, de changer <laughs> au fur et à mesure. I, I cannot see it. I cannot see the presentation. Yes. So I cannot tell you. Okay, excellent. Yes. I can see it now. Good. So if we please go to the next slide, these are the credentials. Ah, pourquoi ça marche pas? Okay, so the topic of my presentation uh, is all about um, the way uh, Muslim communities have been deculturized, um, and I'm doing, I'm, I'm having a small uh, historical uh, background, so I will contextualize uh, this process, and then I will show how uh, social media today, uh, not exclusively but primarily, uh, offer the opportunity to uh, Muslim communities to uh, oppose this deculturization and practically the Arabization of Muslims. So starting with uh, the timeline, um, I personally have um, um, cut the, 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 the Islamic history into three parts. So in the first part, which is the seventh, uh, seventh um, um, uh, century, um, or up to the 7th century, we have the Arab Muslim Caliphates, and this is important because here we have the political power is held by Arabs. And then we have two different um, ways of Islamizing populations. One was through uh, the conquest. So those um, populations, and we will see with details later on, uh, those populations that were um, conquered they were um, absolutely Arabized. So they, they were stripped of their um, individual cultural elements and they became Arab. Uh, this happened primarily in the Levant and North Africa, Egypt, Morocco, um, Tunisia. On the other hand, we have these uh, places where Islam um, was introduced through commerce, through Sufism, and in those places, which was West Africa and Asia, um, local cultures um, existed or coexisted with the Islamic element. So this is the first part of history. The second part is between 8th and 13th Hijri, uh, which is 15th to 19th um, um, century common era, where we have the Ottoman Empire. And here is important to keep in mind that the political power of uh, the Islamic world was in the hands of non-Arabs. And this is important. Now, a small... Um, but important element in this era is the emergence of Wahhabism. And I don't want to take too much time because I need to be um, mindful of the time. I, I hope that everyone knows the story about Wahhabism primarily was a reaction uh, both to colonization, but also to the idea that uh, Turks, non, not Arabs, were um, the leaders, the political leaders of the, Arab, of, of the Muslim world. And then we go to today's, or let's say the last two centuries, 20 and 21st, uh, 20th and 21st century common era, when uh, we have rapid changes in uh, the, what we call Muslim majority countries, we have the colonialism of uh, European powers, um, and is, is, is the time where Wahhabism uh, starts uh, spreading too much into the Muslim majority wor uh, world and intellectuals and scholars of Islam start um, having this imaginary past when we all, all Muslims should uh, return. And part of this imaginary uh, past, a, a very important part, is the Arab culture. So we need to be dressed like Arabs, we need to use the, uh, the, the, the Arabic language, etc., etc. Um, this part, this, this uh, uh, dawah, which primarily happens in the 21st, 20th and 21st century um, by uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, is, is, has, has, been, um, has become possible due to wealth, of course. And we will see this uh, 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 with uh, details. So um, if, if you please go to the next slide.
C'est bon. C'est OK. Thank you. Excellent. So here we see uh, some, um, um, we see how uh, uh, um, Arabization in these places uh, happened through trade and Sufism, practically. So we, um, we have a, a, a historian, Al Batuta, uh, which is very uh, famous, um, a Berber Muslim, uh, fully Arabized uh, scholar and judge. Uh, he lived during the Abbasid, uh, Abbasid Caliphate and he traveled the then known uh, Muslim world. So Batuta describes vividly uh, his shock when uh, he visited Mauritania and then a Qadi, a, a local uh, Muslim judge, he was uh, um, uh, spending time privately with a female friend uh, and also uh, Batuta was shocked by the way the uh, Mauritanian uh, Muslim women were being dressed. And he vocalized that, he uh, actually scolded the, the judge um, and the response that he took, Batuta took, from the locals, uh, including Wakadi, was that these are our customs, our women are different than your women, so we can both be Muslims and keep our culture intact. Which, of course, Batuta was not very happy with this response. But for us today, um, and Eva, if you please go to the next slide. Um, so for us today, it is a, a very good example of how um, they, they kept their uh, elements. I believe that we have um, missed uh, a, a slide, but it's okay, I will catch up uh, verbally. Um, it's okay, it's okay, I'll continue and I will catch up uh, verbally. So this is the, uh, one example of how uh, some uh, Muslim communities kept their um, identity while um, also being Muslim. Uh, another example, <laughs> If I stop the presentation, <laughs> another example of the opposite side of, of how uh, um, communities were being totally um, deculturized is the example of, uh, of North Africa. So we have the Berbers there. And we know by Ibn Khaldun uh, that uh, the Berbers, for example, they didn't accept Islam and they didn't accept the deculturization of their own um, you know, customs uh, as easily. We know that uh, Ibn Khaldun uh, lets us know that uh, uh, Berbers, uh, they apostated uh, 12 times. And also in Egypt, which today is, um, and if you ask any, any Egyptian in the streets today, they identify as Arabs. But we know that uh, the process of Arabization was a long one. It took 500 years for this to happen. These elements shows, show us how uh, deculturation is, is not something that any community accepted uh, willingly or as easily, but it did happen. At some point, local, uh, local com communities, they had to give up in the idea or uh, under the influence that um, if you go against the culture, you go against the religion and ultimately God. Um, so going to our modern era, 20th and 21st century, um, we had um, politically and we will see how deculturation is primarily politically motivated. So we have this struggle between uh, the Saudis and the Egyptians when it comes to authority um, in the Muslim world, comes to authority in the religion, practically. And we, have, uh, we had uh, the two, uh, in the 20th century, the two movements of pan-Islamism and pan-Arabism, which was purely political. Uh, I'm, unfortunately, I didn't have time to put more about that in, in the presentation, but it will be in the paper that hopefully it will be uh, published. So uh, also another element that, 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 uh, that uh, defined this, this deculturation, uh, uh, it's the, the wealth that uh, Saudis suddenly had in their hands. And this wealth permitted them to, um, let's say, perform dawa or, or proselytization uh, in Asia and Balkans, and, and the proselytization that happened is not turning non-Muslims into Muslims, but it was turning Muslims into Arab Muslims. And we will see examples in, in, the, in the next slide, please, Eva. Um, so the Salafi Islam, the Wahhab Islam, which is Islam being practiced in, the, in, the, in, the, in Saudi Arabia, uh, became the only true Islam. Um, the case study that I chose for this presentation is the case study of Pakistan as, as, as a country, as a community, and there is a, a, a very good um, uh, paper written by Hoodboy in 2017, it was published in the Rutledge Handbook of Contemporary Pakistan, 
And we see here examples that uh, Hoodboy gives, how names such as Talha and Faraj and Wael, uh, which are Arab names, now um, are dominant in, in, in Pakistan and um, in South Asia in general. Uh, whereas before that, they were not as common. Um, and local names such as uh, Pervez and Firuz and Shamim, they tend to um, not exist anymore. And from personal experience, I will tell you that I know someone being called Shamim, but um, socially is being called Muhammad. So uh, even, even families that they kept or they tried to keep the names, uh, they, they Arabized them. Um, the extent to Arabization of Pakistan uh, stretched to alteration of uh, the environment. In the 1990s, there was this campaign of importing uh, um, uh, palm trees uh, from Saudi Arabia and planting them in Islamabad. But of course, nature did its job and the trees didn't um, survive for long. So we see how uh, uh, the names change, even the environment, uh, um, uh, there are attempts to change, and also um, clothing, which Parenthesis, uh, the, the clothing goes primarily to females because in Islam it's the female that is, is, is carries on her shoulders the responsibility of being dressed as perfect Muslim or appropriately Muslim. So we see from Hoodboy who uh, states that uh, 20 years ago abaya was a word unfamiliar to speakers of Urdu and never had been seen. This shapeless gown, usually black, is of Arab origin, so it's an Arabic cultural element. But today, countless shops in every city of Pakistan specialize in abayas, hijabs, and burqas, while dancing and festivities are ascribed to the Hindu corruption of the culture. And Eva, if we please go to the next one. So we see how on different elements, uh, the influence of, of um, Saudi Islam um, is, is, is changing or attempts to change uh, the culture of Pakistan. Eva, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. So going, this, this is the, the contextualization of how uh, the culturation happened in the past and how it happens today. It's still, it, it is still uh, uh, it's something that is it's happening still. And we see how the resistance happens today. So we don't have information about the, the types of resistance in the past. It's very limited, our information. But for today, we do. Uh, the primary um, element or the primary tool used for this resistance is social media. Uh, we saw already, I mean, the, the, um, the paper I mentioned from Hoodboy, it's a very good example of how uh, uh, this resistance is trying to take place in academia. But as we all know, uh, academia is primarily from, for academics. So for the lay believers, for the lay Muslims, it's social media that makes the difference. And the four elements that I um, spotted in, the, in, in campaigns, or in, in sometimes it's campaigns, as we will see, we will see examples, but sometimes it's just um, spontaneous uh, expression of grievances. So we see presentation, we see emancipation, uh, preservation or effort of preservation of the culture, of the individual culture, and resistance to this Arabization of Muslims. Um, Eva, if we please go to the next uh, slide. Thank you. So the first uh, um, um, example, or, uh, I, have, I have taken different uh, examples from different uh, parts of the world. The first one comes from Pakistan, uh, where in December 2019, Mufti Abu Layth, uh, which is quite popular uh, Muslim preacher, uh, he's, he, he creates uh, content in English. Um, he mentioned, or let's say he touched this element of the culturalization of um, South Asian Muslims in general, uh, stating, and I quote, importing a lot, of, a lot of Gulf Islam, women wearing black burqas, replacing words, people refuse to say Huda Hafiz anymore, they just say Allah Hafiz. Um, two years later, February 2021, a year from today, um, there was this decision of the Pakistani government to introduce Arabic uh, compulsory as a, as a language uh, in, in, in schools. And at this period, we had uh, several videos uh, published primarily in Urdu language, uh, where people were expressing their grievances and their opposition in this decision. Uh, they were creating uh, parallel examples with Turkey and to what extent Turkey has Arabic language as a compulsory language. Um, and also in one of these um, videos, um, there was a member of Pakistan's parliament who, who, who 
that was condemning uh, the decision. The fact that uh, these, uh, these videos were created in Urdu, it makes um, me personally as a researcher understand that um, they were not campaigning something outside the country. It was a, um, a real fear and a real um, opposition of, of lay people to the government's decision um, and, and makes us understand that people don't really like that. I mean, all these examples of Arabization of Pakistan that uh, we saw earlier, uh, it, it's something that is being somehow forced down the throat of people. They don't really uh, agree with it. Uh, but of course, the question here is to what extent can they um, oppose such decisions? Eva, if we please go to the next. Okay, another example from India, and this example comes from YouTube. Uh, it is, it was a comment. So here comes the element of emancipation and how when we have uh, uh, videos such as uh, the video that I mentioned in the previous uh, slide um, uh, from um, Mufti, so the, the, uh, the Mufti's video where he, the Mufti, was expressing grievances and, and opposition, then we have users that they leave their own comments expre expressing their own ideas, which we call it metada metadata in, in, in studying social media. And here is, this is one of these comments uh, where the user, it was a male user, uh, stated, I'm 100% Indian, my family has been since the beginning, yet we all have Arab names. Worst part is that Desi Muslims, Pakistanis and Indians, willingly accept their own cultural destruction. So here we start having the language being shaped appropriately to show the importance of what is happening and the opposition of this. Uh, the user continues saying, when I suggested to my mom that I wanted to give my potential future children Indian names, she almost threw a knife at me. Which is also an important uh, um, element in the sense that um, it, it, it relates to what I mentioned earlier, the extent to which lay Muslim uh, believers can resist this uh, stripping of their cultural elements. Which we see it's not easy because if um, a person didn't have the... Um, comfort to express such a wish within the family, within the, the, the comfort of the family, how this would be possible in the community or even in, in, in the context of the country. So we see that it's not an easy process, it's not an easy thing to oppose uh, the, the loss of the culture, but they still, they try to do it as much as they can. Eva, if we please go to the next one. Uh, here's an example from Somalia, Somalia uh, in a video published in 2021 um, titled Arabization of Somali Culture. Uh, there was an abstract of an event organized by um, university students in Somalia to promote uh, Somali uh, culture. And the, the abstract that I chose specifically was uh, where a young Muslim, a young uh, Somali man actually, stated, the culture of this country is missing. Where is our culture? And he continued stating, let people know who we are before what we believe in. Now, the video continued with the students performing traditional dances uh, in traditional clothing, which one could see that the, the, the clothing and the movements uh, oh, had nothing that could be deemed un-Islamic or opposing Islam or the ethics of Islam. However, um, so it, it could perfectly fit within the Islamic context. The, the, the people could keep their Islamic identity and their Somali identity and, and have them coexisting peacefully. Um, and this is what these students were trying to do successfully, in my opinion. Um, but we see how uh, in, in narration of the, of, of the nation, we will say, or, or the country, um, the one demands the erasure of the other. And if we please go to the next one. This example comes from Malaysia, and uh, um, which also is, is, a, is a Muslim majority country, and is a country where lately a lot of Arab Islam is being uh, imported. Um, and from personal experience, I mean, three days ago I was in Cairo, I returned three days ago, and I visited um, Al Azhar Mosque. And to my surprise, the majority of the students, uh, majority of the people inside the mosque, uh, they were Malaysian, Malaysian students. That they had traveled to, to study uh, Islam in Egypt. And then, of course, they will import this uh, Islam in their own 
country. So the statement comes from uh, Marina Manaf Manafir, I hope I pronounced it correctly, founder of Sisters in Islam. And she states, there is this idea that the more like Arabs you are, the better Muslim you are. That's the very real obliteration of our cultural heritage. So another cry about culture. If we please go to the next uh, slide. Uh, the this, this is the final example uh, that comes from Afghanistan. And as we all know, or we are aware, um, recently, September 2020, actually, I think it was August 2021 when Taliban um, uh, took hold of Afghanistan. Now, in Sept on September, um, in September 5th, um, they imposed uh, to university, to female university students to wear whatever they called hijab, but then um, we had this um, organized, this event that was organized by the Taliban, or that's what we believe, where hundreds of Afghan women filled the auditorium of Kabul University in burqas, in actual burqas, um, and uh, this, the burqa is what Taliban call hijab, which is not hijab, um, and Bahar Jalali uh, was, is the creator of a spontaneous, I would say, movement um, uh, that circulated in social media and then it became so prominent that was also broadcasted by conventional media like um, newspapers and, and magazines and, and TV shows. Uh, the movement is called Do Not Touch My Clothes and uh, it's primarily, I think exclusively, uh, women, uh, Afghani women that live in the West and they dress in their traditional clothes to show the difference. The statement says, what the Taliban were trying to do was to subvert Afghan heritage and culture. And here, uh, uh, Bahar Jalali uh, uh, refers specifically to the event in the university when the university students appeared with burqas. Uh, I see clothing that is completely foreign to Afghan culture. Um, before we go to the next slides and I show you the, um, the visual elements of, of this specific um, um, Case study. Okay, so here, this is the one. This, so this is the picture from uh, the university uh, in September 2021. We see how uh, the students are being dressed and all of us that we are Muslims and we know the different types of clothing in Islam, we know that this is not a hijab. Uh, if we please go to the next uh, slide. So here are some examples and I have uh, secured approval for sharing them. So here are some examples of how Afghani women outside of Afghanistan, of course, for purposes of safety and security, they have promoted their own culture, the Afghani culture, um, showing that this black cloth is something Arab and you can be Afghani and you can be Muslim, you can be modestly dressed but colorfully, full of life, full of, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the individual Afghan culture. Um, so these are the examples that I put in the presentation. One thing that I didn't put, but I would like to mention, and I, I was just trying to catch up with time, but now I have one minute, is how this deculturation, it's, it's, very, well, it's very, it is easy for us as researchers to uh, spot it, identify it, and research it when it comes to countries like uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Uh, one case that it is almost, impossible to uh, identify is what happens to converts. I happen to be a convert and I know firsthand some of, of the requirements that Muslims or born Muslims have from us. And the most important is that they require we change our name. So the first question uh, anyone asks me when I inform them that I'm convert and a question that uh, imams have asked me in mosques is, and what is your Islamic name? And when they say Islamic name, they mean what is your Arab name? Where we all know uh, that, I mean, psychology, states, and sociology, that our names are uh, maybe the most intrinsic part of our identity slash culture. So when we're being asked as converts to change our name in aim to sound more Muslim, this is also a, a, an element of deculturation. But again, as I said, this is something that it's more autobiographical and it's something I have discussed with other converts. And less, um, I mean, we cannot really make a case study on that as easily as we can when it comes to countries. Um, this was the presentation. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope you found it useful.